Welcome to my channel, All for Health with Jane. Family, on the 3rd of June, Tabo Bester raised concerns over his violation to human dignity and unlawful detention conditions by the prison officials at the Koshimampuru Correctional Services. The judge advised him to get a legal team and raise those concerns via his legal team, which is the correct procedure. On this video, we see Tabo Pester's legal representative, El Rato Muela, presenting Tabo Pester's concerns, but unfortunately, uh, they did not complete and follow the right procedures as the judge had advised. Tabo Pester still fighting for his rights, thinking that he can do better than his lawyer. When the judge says he's not going to entertain his application, that is not complete. Tabo Pester wants to intervene. Uh, he wants to represent himself. And the judge shuts him down uh, when he tries to do that. Family, to mention some of the concerns of Tabo Pester, Tabo Pester wants to be, uh, in fact, he wants more hours of freedom from the isolation cell than the hours that he's being given, because apparently he's being given only one hour outside of that isolation cell. So he wants more hours than the hour that he's been given. Tabo Pester wants to have a, a laptop with him in that cell, those are some of the things that he feels because he's not allowed to do. He feels that his rights as a human being are being violated. Family, let's listen. As Advocate Lerato Muela is presenting all those concerns by Tabo Pester. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pester. Your excuse, Mr. Snellenberg. Yes, you also excuse, gentlemen and lady. Good. Yes, uh, Mr. Moila. Okay, no problem. Uh, look, the, the application, as I informed you, is uh, not ripe for hearing as things are because you indicated that you would like to consult with your client and then thereafter file a replying affidavit uh, not so yes yes mr snellenberg has also indicated that uh, regardless of uh, the flaws in your application uh, they would take a pragmatic approach and have the matter uh, argued as soon as it is ripe. Uh, Mr. Snellenberg, I see the state is the first respondent. I assume you're also appearing on behalf of the state, whoever and whatever that is. Uh, then there is the National Commission of Correctional Services, the head of the center at Khosi Mampuru, and then the Minister of Correctional Services. All the respondents. Good. 
Thank you. Yes. Uh, oh. Mr. Moyla? Yes. Mr. Moyla, I suggest that you deal with the relevant issue at this stage, and that is the fact that you have not yet filed a replying affidavit. It will not help you to argue anything in front of me now, when, you have, when the matter is not ripe for hearing. Any arguments that you want to bring with regard to jurisdiction or anything else can only be entertained by me or any other court that I, or any other judge that I assign the matter to when the matter is ripe for hearing. Yes, do. If it's going to be held in a civil court, the accused is not required to come in terms of the criminal. In fact, it's not even in terms of the criminal procedure to be there. But if it's held by a criminal court, he is entitled to be here when the matter is there. And my understanding from the discussion in chambers, and that's why I then say that this would be something that would be ventilated in court, that the issue of the forum, in fact, it has nothing to do with the reply after because in the answering after it, it's the parties are adding them that the criminal court should adjudicate this matter. They probably replied, uh, remember we, 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 we advanced the issue the, the, because the respondent agreed that this court has jurisdiction. So the setting down of the matter is very important, whether in a civil court or in a criminal court. Otherwise, I would not have even asked this court to adjourn if there was not an agreement in Mr. Moyla, you brought this application as a civil uh, notice of motion. It is for that reason that you have asked for cost orders against the people that you have cited. It is for that reason that you have cited all these people. And uh, as you can see, uh, Mr. Snellenberg, who appears on behalf of these respondents, is not the prosecutor in the matter. If you desire to bring a application in the criminal court, you are free to do so without asking for civil remedies like cost orders, unless you can tell me uh, which section in the Criminal Procedure Act deals with cost orders in a criminal case, uh, except, except, of course, for the cost order section that is uh, not yet uh, in operation, section uh, 142A, capital A, yes. one. And then two, you decided to come to this court via this route. Three, if the matter is going to be argued on the papers, uh, you are still going to file your reply, you will file your heads of argument, Mr. Snellenberg will appear on behalf of the respondents. You will appear on behalf of the applicant. If your application is premised on the accused being present during those uh, uh, arguments, I, I can see no reason why he should be present. And I can see no prejudice to him. Because you say you want to consult with him so that you can, conf so that you can file your replying affidavit. So if, if you, you think that... Uh, you want the case locked into the criminal stream because you want your client to be present. Then, Mr. Moyla, I can tell you now that uh, if that is your game plan, it is the wrong game plan. Because Section 158, Subsection 1 of the Criminal Procedure Act deals with the presence of the accused in criminal proceedings. And that is not what you brought here. May I not may I please answer the question to the question that you wrote? Yes, and please do. You know, people then realize that all 
this question if they've been answered by change law. I will have a small discussion that in that discussion I will reduce my voice and elevate the voice of the change law. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yes. Then we start, because that question itself obviously is the issue of forum. So let me start by the court case of this division. In the case of Mukesh, if I will give the leadership the reference. In the case of Mukesh of this division, uh, reference Mukesh versus Mukesh and others versus S. 2022. <coughs> Is 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 your client asserting a section thirty five right yes. on your paper, sir? I don't. You see, th that's why I say maybe maybe you should file your reply, and then we deal with the matter. When the matter is ripe, you can then argue all these things that you want to argue. The, the, the judge assigned to the case will then deal with it. You see, what 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 you are asserting in this case is there has been a cascade of failures by everybody concerned, from the police who uh, keep the accused to members of EST, I don't know what uh, that acronym stands for, uh, to the National Commissioner of Correctional Services uh, in the way he is kept, the way he is transported, what he eats, who must prepare his food. Now, I don't see Section 35 dealing with those issues. The, the, the closest that you come to Section 35 rights is under Section 35.3e, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, him being present during his trial. Now, but the fact that the chef that prepares his food must write his name and surname down before giving him food. Is that a Section 35 right, sir? No, but the thing is, you are saying all your, your prayers are all in terms of Section, your Section 35 rights. But I'm saying to you, you go far, be, you stray far beyond Section 35. And the, the case law that you are referring me to does not help you, one. Two, if you want to argue an accused fair trial rights, the criminal court is the place to do so. But now you stray beyond that in, in, in this application, you see. And, and, and that is the simple point uh, in this matter. If you reply and you consider your cause of action properly, you can then approach the judge who will be dealing with the matter and argue all these issues that you want to argue, the judge will then make a ruling at that stage. I am not going to make a ruling in this matter on a half-baked case at this stage, Mr. Moila. That is how simple it is. The case is just not ripe for me to make a ruling even on this point. That's how simple it is. Make it. Then your lordship can then have this comment after I've made a point because we've reached a situation where it now it's one sided. After I made a point, you make your point and proceed before I, I, I analyze the point. This because say exactly opposite what your lordship are saying, they don't say. The other things, when you deal with the constitutional rights, the fact that you have a fair trial right in section 35 does not mean that the same conduct cannot violate your right to dignity. 
does not mean that it can be the other right. If that is the interrelatedness of the violation of the right. So your logic, what your logic does goes to the tail end of our application and focus on other minutia of the rights and ignore the causa. When you watch it, you read our papers, we start, and this is what we say in paragraph 10 of the, part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the application. We say, I'm going to read it, because now what the Lordship is trying to do is create a situation as if like we don't know what we are doing and we are informed by the law. So it's very important to also place validation here. <laughs> paragraph 10 of our funding application, this is what it says. The ground norm or the fundamental basis of the application is section 35, 1A, 2B, 2, uh, 2E, 3D, 3E, 3H of the Constitution. Right? I'm advised that the observance of this, and when you look at this, all this provision, they deal with the speedy trial, they deal with the right of consultation, they deal with the right of legal representation that is effective. And we know when you determine the issue of jurisdiction, you look at the pleadings, the founding papers, what they say, and that's a principle in Zawa. You don't even look at the merits, so you don't have to even have to wait for the reply. Because the founding papers tells you the right that the accused is asserting. The reply, it can't even make the case in the reply. He has made it in the founding papers and it tells you that it's section 35. It goes on to say that I'm advised that the observance of the provision in section 35 of the Constitution highlighted in the preceding paragraph would guarantee my right to attack trial. Then this is what the membership considerations or what I call a take end of what we are doing now. In section 35 of the Constitution, I employ this court to adopt an intersectional analysis of other constitutional rights. Then your logic speak about e food, e the food and all that. Those, that is the intersectional analysis. You can't look at one right in isolation. So these papers, as they stand, as they stand, they accept not any other right. They accept section 35. The fact that he's complaining about the right to dignity does not remove the jurisdiction of this court. That's what it says. And that's the principle of the constitutional court in Zawa. You look at it, in fact, what you must really do, you must accept that this version is true for the purpose of jurisdiction, even if we can lose on the merits. So that is important. So it's unfair for the accused person who comes to court to assert section 35 and is told because now he has raised the issue of torture. It's a fact that he's been tortured. They don't dispute that. They simply say that they are allowed to torture him in terms of the Correctional Service Act. The torture is not disputed. It's not disputed that he's incarcerated for 23 hours a day and only given one hour of exercise. They simply say that the act in terms of the Correctional Service Act. I can't, as a practitioner, remain supine when I see those violations. Because ultimately, and this will then be actually in due course, ultimately and cumulatively, this would affect his mental health. So by the 10th of Feb, you might not have accused number seven mentally fit. And that's what the case law says. So it's very important that we contextualize this case and do not concentrate on the minutia of other rights. Are you done? Yes. That is the point that I was making. So I, I, it's, it's, it's I, clear that the people say the opposite of what your lordship is saying. Are you done? And all the subsection. The issue of him being here is the 158 of the criminal procedure act that says every criminal proceedings, he must be here. He's entitled. I don't have to motivate that what purpose that is served. That's a legislative entitlement. And there's a plethora of cases to that effect as well. And the, the reason why I wanted to start with Mukesi. Mukesi, because I thought maybe it would be given some elevation because it's a, it's, 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 it's a decision of this division. But there are cases specifically that says that it matters not. Because last week, what, what you were told that this is, we use a notice of application or notice of motion. A plethora of cases that have prosecuted the application through a notice of motion. In fact, it's even encouraged. It's even encouraged so that it can facilitate the proceedings. The reason you see the respondent being here is because they were invited properly and they came here in terms of the invitation. Otherwise, if we adopted a process where we don't know what we are doing, we would not have, we would not have be having a respondent. So that is important for me to place it in context. And that's why I say that in the setting of the matter down, the issue of jurisdiction 
would be determined by the criminal. We're in the criminal court. It can't be taken to a motion court or a motion court to determine it. This particular court that must even determine its own jurisdiction. If we are wrong on that aspect, then the court will change us and will take it, knowing very well that we are living, but on the wrong side, we are living with the right side of the law. Because all other cases support our proposition. Then we can then uh, uh, assist the accused to prosecute someone. But uh, truly speaking, uh, and with utmost respect, it is unfair to select certain paragraphs in the affidavit and we elevate it and we say that this application is about that. When the applicant himself says that the entire application is about this aspect, the rest of the aspect is inviting the court to adopt an intersectional analysis, which is not a foreign concept in our constitutional discussion. I will not take this argument further than that, but I just wanted to place it in context. It will be argued in the fullness of time. But that fullness of time must happen in a criminal court so that we can ventilate it properly and not be subjected to the strictures of motion court. Are you done? Yes, that is my submission. Mr. Snellenberg? Yes, thank you, Mr. Snellenberg. Any reply to what Mr. Snellenberg has said? Just one point uh, on the jurisdiction. Paragraph 59 of the answering affidavit. When we raise the issue that this court has jurisdiction, it reads as follows when they accept that this court has jurisdiction. While the respondent, I mean, they say they don't take any issue. While the respondent do not take the issue, they do not take this court to determine the applicant's complaint. It is important to highlight that the Act and the regulation make provision for complaints and request procedure address to address inmate grievances. So now uh, they don't dispute the jurisdiction of the court. They simply speak about the other process that need to be followed. So they can't come here and all of a sudden be opportunistic and then say that we did not uh, say anything about the jurisdiction when they said in their answer in that day. That is the, 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 the but in, in, in respect of other submissions that we have, we take no issue. We are, we, we are willing to argue this case uh, 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 at appropriate time when the pleadings are closed, but it must be clear that in the criminal court... So why, why did you now argue all along if you are now saying this matter will be argued in the fullness of time when the pleadings are closed? Because that is what I've been trying to impress upon you from the beginning, from the first time that you stood up to try and argue this matter. Because... Even on your own argument, sir, on your own argument, if you, firstly, I told you the last time around, if anything, these papers before me are not proper. At the time, these papers were not served properly on all the respondents. One. Two. No days were mentioned to them as to when they should uh, uh, answer to your papers. Three, the people that you have cited, I mean the state, it's the first time that I see the state is cited as an entity. Then, uh, because there are certain members of the executive who are responsible for certain state actions, 
Then, sir, your application, for an example, and, and maybe I should read it to you, so that you, you, you start thinking about your application, and maybe, uh, if so advised, uh, look properly at it and see whether it deals with Section 35 rights exclusively. You, paragraph 1, you, you say, of your notice of motion, declaring the conduct of the second and third respondents in refusing applicant meaningful consultation in preparation of his matter to be unconstitutional and invalid. Paragraph 2, declaring the conduct of the second and third respondents in refusing the applicant's request to use a laptop, tablet, or any suitable gadget uh, in preparation of his case to be unconstitutional and invalid. Then, declaring the conduct of the second and third respondents in refusing to make reasonable provision or, or accommodation for the applicant to consult uh, in person with his legal representative to be unconstitutional and invalid. For the duration and in preparation of his criminal case, direct, directing the second and third respondents to afford the applicant the following. An in-person consultation allow the applicant to use a tablet or a laptop or any suitable gadget. Declaring the conduct of the second and third respondents in keeping the applicant in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day to be unconstitutional and invalid. Declaring the second and third respondents to remove the applicant from solitary confinement and keep him in a normal cell. Declaring the conduct of the second and third respondents in bringing the applicant to attend this criminal case uh, and and leg calf to be unconstitutional and invalid. De directing the first and second respondents to desist from a hand and leg cuffing the respondent whilst in court. Directing the, the conduct of the f first, second, and or third respondent in bringing the applicant to attend this case in violation of section 9, 10, 12 of the Constitution uh, to be unconstitutional and invalid. Pending the determination of the above prayers, the plea trial will be set down for the 24th of July, which has come and gone. Further alternative, and pending the, the determination of the above prayers 4 and 6 and 8, in the notice of application, apply forthwith as an interim order. The first and second respondents be ordered to pay the cost of this application on an attorney and client scale for counsel uh, so employed. Then, in the affidavit itself, you say that you've made out a case for an interdict. Firstly, uh, and I will read it to you. You say, I am advised that, in, in, or your client, in order for the application to succeed regarding the final end or interim relief that I am seeking the applica application has to meet the following requirements. That I have a clear right that is worthy of protection for a final interdict and a prima facie right, even though open to some doubt for an interim relief. Now, it's not even clear whether you're asking interim relief or final relief. Uh, then you say that there's a reasonable apprehension of harm or harm has actually occurred. That the balance of convenience favors the granting of an interim relief. C can you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, now, is, is this now, now, I'm saying to you, uh, Mr. Moyla, and I'm not going to enter into a debate with you about this issue again. I'm saying to you that your, your prayers, firstly, are civil prayers, and secondly, they stray far beyond uh, the Section 35 rights. Now, you go, you file your replying affidavit, and you act in terms of the rules of this court, and this matter will then be set down. A judge will hear the matter, and the judge will then decide. If you want to to say to to argue to the judge that the matter must be postponed, you must make or she must make a ruling that your client must be there at that stage when you make your arguments. You are welcome to do so. 
I am not going to entertain an argument now on this half-paid application. Complete the application, complete all the papers, do what you must do in terms of the law, and then you can come back to me. All right. Uh, no, you may not speak. You have a legal representative. Yes. You can hear what he has to say. Pardon? You say? I'm saying that I'm giving an opportunity to write instruction and I'm giving you a lot of so that you can understand. Because this is the person that's suffering. So when he sees this in Vietnam, obviously he's doing that. So I'm asking you a lot of shit to explain to him. No, there's no problem with that. But I will, I will not allow him to speak yes, because yes. you are here to speak on his behalf. Yes, that's correct. Yes. But, you know, I don't want to go back and forth on this. The issue here, the only issue here is when the presiding officer the court to make the, the application will be ventilated in front of another judge at the opportune time, sir. Then you can ventilate all these issues. Mine is to get this matter trial ready. That's my task. If you want to argue all these things in front of the trial judge, you may do so. Or the, the judge that will hear the application. To comment on what, sir? Your Lordship gave me a list of questions. When I was answering the first question, your Lordship then interjected and not allowed... Are you going back there now? No, but I'm just... What, what, uh, what, what is your point, Mr. Moila? What is your point, please? I, I, I fail to understand the point. I've, I've been repeating myself over and over again, and you've also said you'll ventilate this point at the opportune time. Now, this is not yet the opportune time. That is how simple this whole issue is. Mm. When I stood up, the Lord Chief gave me a list of questions. Address this, address that, address that. On top of that, the Lord Chief made comments about our application. In addressing those questions, I brought to the court's attention that actually what this court says is opposite to what our papers say. But then I've read the papers. Yes. Then, my learned colleague then responded. Then I said, in that circumstance, of his uh, sensible suggestion. There's no need to say anything further because he didn't say anything that is worthy of responding because he didn't invite me. But when your Lordship may comment and invite me, I'm but, prepared to respond. But, sir, you said to me, you brought your paper, your paper. The things that I have uh, said to you are selective. I've read your entire uh, application or, or, or prayers to you. And I'm saying to you, like I said earlier, they stray, in my view, beyond your Section 35 rights. And I do not want to enter into a further debate with you. Make sure that you file your replying affidavit. Uh, make sure that you file uh, your heads of argument. Uh, in terms of the rules of this court, a judge will be assigned to deal with the matter. And that judge, you can go and ventilate all these things in front of the judge. I will assign the judge to listen to your entire argument, even on the jurisdiction issue. Everything that you want to ventilate, that judge will hear when the papers are ripe, sir. That's the only point. The papers are just not ripe. That point is accepted. Precisely. Now, if that point is accepted, I expect you then to sit down. And, uh, and yes, then the matter is over. You took an instruction from your client. Is it relevant? Do you want to ventilate that instruction or not? His concern, obviously, is the concern that I'm trying to face here. So, and it stems from the comment that if your logic has said that this application is not right... I've said that from the beginning, Mr. Moelo. Mr. Moeller, I have said that. You either now deal with the, the 
instruction from your client or you will file your replying affidavit and this matter will be dealt with in terms of the rules of this court. A judge will be assigned to listen to your argument. In that deals. Precisely. Precisely. No need at all. Yes, the criminal matter has already been postponed to the 10th of February uh, 2025. The accused will be brought to court on that day. Court adjourns. Thank you, family, for watching this video to the end. Let's meet in the comment section. Please do not forget to like it before you leave. Subscribe for my channel if you haven't done so yet. I love you, family. Thank you. Bye.